Thank you very much for tuning into another video with Tony Brock Fisher from the United States, KP1KP. You've seen all about him before, but you can also read all about Tony elsewhere. But what we want to do is follow up, and thanks for Tony for raising this. There are a number of comments in the last video, which were you know genuinely great comments and pertinent to understanding polar modulation even more. So we've got Tony now to explain even more and to give you that deep dive. So over to you, Tony. All right, David. Um, yeah, so um, getting a lot of questions about what is polar modulation and, and what does it really do for you? Um, and so I'll try to I'll try to give an explanation uh, as best I can uh, without uh, without involving any diagrams or math. Uh, we try to just do it the easy way. Um, so uh, first off, what is the goal? Um, and the, the goal in the in this project was higher efficiency. And I, I think we did talk about what higher efficiency buys you and why that's a good thing to go after. Um, and so now we'll get into a little bit more detail about uh, efficiency and, and how we get to high efficiency and how polar modulation helps us to do that. So uh, typical amplifiers, and it doesn't really matter whether it's an audio amplifier or an RF amplifier or whatever, um, they're described in terms of classes. So you may have heard the terms a class A amplifier, class B, so forth. They're identified with letters of the alphabet. And um, generally speaking, as you go from A to B to C, um, two things are happening, and that's actually a trade-off. Um, the efficiency is going up. So a class B has higher efficiency than A, and C has higher efficiency than B. Uh, and the linearity goes down. So uh, efficiency is really how much power do you get out as compared to how much power you put in. And obviously the goal would be to, to hit 100%. Um, and that's as like all things that follow laws of thermodynamics, that's not really achievable, but we can, we can try to get as close as we can. Now, um, the other thing that changes with A to B to C is linearity. So the amplifier class with the highest linearity is class A, and then B is less linear, and C is less linear than B, and so forth. So why do we care about linearity, and what, what is linearity? Linearity means that uh, the output of the amplifier is a, a perfect copy of the input, only larger. We really want the amplifier to perfectly scale up uh, the voltage waveform of the input without introducing any distortion. And so uh, the uh, the best amplifier classes for that are class A, and they have very low distortion, either in terms of intermodulation distortion or in terms of harmonic distortion. Intermodulation distortion results in new products in the output that weren't there in the input. And these products can appear uh, right next to the occupied bandwidth. So in an RF amplifier, if we want a 3 kilohertz bandwidth for our voice characteristics in single sideband, we also don't want any energy outside of that bandwidth because that would interfere with uh, people having QSOs on neighboring frequencies. And so that's why linearity matters to us. Um, we also care about harmonic distortion in which case the uh, the extra energy that comes out would be at a harmonic frequency of the of the fundamental input. So we have amplifier classes and the traditional ones are A, B, and C, and those are all uh, fairly linear amplifiers. And then we have uh, a whole uh, slew of other classes above that with D, E, F, and so forth. And those are switching amplifiers. And switching amplifiers are much different from linear amplifiers um, because they have much higher efficiency. And but there's a there's a trade off. There's something that you give up. So in a linear amplifier like a class A, there's a power device like a transistor or a tube. And that device is essentially almost always turned on in a class A. It, it is really always turned on to some extent. And in a class C, it's not turned on all the time. Some part of the time it's turned off completely. And so 
because uh, in a linear amplifier, the devices are turned on at part of the time, there's power being dissipated in the device. So we're wasting some power in the transistor or the tube. So this is why if you're going to buy a tube amplifier, you want one that has big tubes in it, like uh, three 500 Zs can dissipate 500 watts right in the tube. And that's wasted power. Um, then as you get to the switching amplifiers, um, they uh, have devices which are either turned on completely or turned off completely. And if they're turned on completely, they have a very low on resistance. And therefore, they have a very low voltage drop across them. The voltage drop across them is determined by the current through the device and the on resistance. And then when they're turned off, they have zero current across them, passing through them. Um, so in both cases, they're dissipating very little power or zero power. So they're much more efficient because they're not dissipating power in the amplifying device. Now, what you give up is that in a switching amplifier, the amplitude of the output signal is determined purely by the power supply. In a linear amplifier, it's determined by the size of the input to the greatest degree. It is limited by the size of the power supply, but it is nominally independent of the power supply. In a switching amplifier, the amplitude that you get out is completely determined by the power supply voltage. So in a switching amplifier, we have a uh, an input which goes to the gate of the device, typically, um, or the base of a transistor, and it controls the phase of the output. So we still have excellent phase control, but we don't have any amplitude control because the amplitude of the output is purely determined by the power supply. If we could figure out a way to control the power supply, and then we would have a way of controlling the amplitude and the phase of the output of a switching amplifier. And it turns out that Euler figured out uh, a couple hundred years ago that if you can control the amplitude and phase, then you can completely uh, synthesize any waveform that you want. So we hear all this talk about I and Q. And I and Q are basically the in phase, which is the I, and the Q quadrature phase uh, representations of an RF signal. And the reason we use I and Q is because if you only use one of them, then you can't determine which way the RF is going. If you think of it as a wheel, and you look, think of I as the horizontal position of, the, of a point on the wheel, you can see it going back and forth in a sine wave manner, but you can't tell which way the wheel is turning. And this is why if you simply mix an audio signal with an RF carrier, you get sidebands on both sides. And this is what happens in AM transmission. You get one sideband above the carrier and one below it. And those represent the wheel turning in each of the two directions that it could turn. If we then add a Q signal, which might be the up and down position of a point on the wheel, now we can tell exactly which way it's turning. And mathematically, in DSP, we can now apply an audio signal to an RF carrier and only get one sideband, whichever one we want, upper sideband or lower sideband. So if we have the ability to control the amplitude and phase going into a switching amplifier, we can still generate a single sideband signal, uh, generate a unique signal and not, not end up with uh, signals both above and below the carrier. And so this is basically where polar modulation comes in. Polar modulation is just another way of expressing how to get to a certain point on the map. So if I want to tell you how to get someplace, I could give you its latitude and longitude, and you could use a GPS and get to that point. I could also tell you, starting from where you are now, go at a compass heading of a certain heading, like 45 degrees for a certain distance, like two miles, and that also defines a specific point. It, the polar modulation is, is really 
just that. It's just another way of describing a particular point. The thing about polar modulation is that it, by giving a range and a, and a bearing, the bearing is essentially your phase information that goes to the gate of a switching amplifier. And the range is the amplitude information, which goes to the power supply that you're controlling on the switching amplifier. And then once again, we can specify any particular location that we're trying to get to. We can synthesize any RF waveform we want with amplitude and phase. So that's basically what polar modulation is. I, you can go through a lot of complicated math, and, and I, I would welcome folks to try it. Um, the range is simply, if you're trying to convert from I and Q to polar modulation, the range is the square root of the sum of the squares of I and Q. And the uh, phase is the arctangent of Q, R, Q over I. So um, you can take I and Q data and convert it very easily into uh, polar modulation data. And the thing is that when you do that, you end up with exactly the kind of signals that we need to drive a switching amplifier. And so that's why we use polar modulation. And it's really just a, a handy way of coming up with the signals that we need to drive a high efficiency amplifier. Okay, and as we said before, the high efficiency amplifier for the equivalent, I'm just thinking back to a video I did before, Tony, which was about, because when I first saw about the flex, I was listening to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. And I was thinking about watts per kilogram. So straight away, we've got, you get more watts per kilogram of weight of a rig because of that efficiency. Yes, we, we improved the, the uh, features of the radio by improving the efficiency. I don't think this would have influenced you at all, but I was just thinking from a marketing person's point of view, is uh, what's per dollar? I've seen the kits that have been done, and uh, hands particularly at QRP Labs, you know, very inexpensive kits that are tiny. Uh, and now we've got, you've come at the other end of it. And that reminds me of the days that I used to, uh, you know, the Chapel and Marshall telemetry at Salt Lake City, and we used to exchange emails about who invented the greatest inventions. What's quite clear is when you guys get hold of something, we've been building over here in Europe QRP versions of this, but you've got the whole arc and produce something that's 500 watts. But 500 watts for a small unit, which is very different. And is that really the crux? So when people are wondering how this, what this is, they can get what you were just talking about then, which was brilliant, which is crystallized. But in a practical sense, it's not going to sound any different, the other end. The, the device you're using, whatever that device might be in the future, um, if everybody adopts polar modulation, it's going to be a lot smaller and weigh a lot less. That's right. That's right. Polar modulation is, isn't uh, something that by itself improves efficiency. Uh, it's, it's just a, a tool that we use to be able to use a high efficiency amplifier, and that's what improves the efficiency is to use right. a switching amplifier instead of a linear amplifier. What One of the criticisms was in the past with polar modulation, because of the switching, you could get a lot of noise in the signal. What was, what, what changed to get rid of that noise? Um, well, so one thing that's important to understand is that if we, if we could implement everything perfectly, then there would be absolutely no difference between a signal generated with polar modulation and a signal generated in a conventional way with I and Q in a, in a, in a DAC, uh, a, D, a, a D to A converter. Um, so mathematically, they're identical. And so you wouldn't be able to tell anything by listening to the signals. Now, like everything else in the world, uh, there's the mathematic uh, perfection, and then there's the real world implementation which usually falls short in some way uh, of perfection. And so, you know, that's uh, something that took a lot of work to, uh, to achieve was to, to get everything working as well as we could. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that there will be improvements forthcoming, you know, in terms of fidelity. It's just like, it's just like hi-fi. Um, you know, in the old days, if you had a tube amp, you thought it was pretty good and then, uh, uh, some people think that uh, the newer amps are better, you know, <laughs> and the, the differences are so slight that there's a lot of uh, 
uh, crazy arguments back and forth of the audio files. But uh, in fact, they're both pretty good. So we get in the whole science of the human here, you know, we perceive things. I think, I think you've cracked it. I don't think anybody would misunderstand that. That was a great, I love the wheel, the explanation of the wheel. I think it's brilliant. I've not seen it like that because you always see a static wheel or circle and you mm -hmm. see the pole. And, and you know, you, you, I think of it as, you know, when I first heard your pole, oh, right, so it must be north and south. Is there, is there anything else that people should know you think that they might be confused about or any w words of wisdom? Uh, only that, you know, we're we're striving to give them exactly the same waveform, you know, exactly the same uh, uh, kind of performance on the air that they're used to. Um, and that if everything's working correctly, they shouldn't be able to tell whether they're listening to a, a flex radio or Aurora or you know, a, a Collins KWS one. Um, you know, they should both be generating single sideband as as well as they can given the uh, bandwidth limitations that you have on HF. And also, I'm just thinking from a power consumption point of view, I know we've mentioned this before, but a power consumption point of view, because it because it takes that much less power, having these things living plugged into our mains electricity. So I was, I was contemplating using Aurora for uh, US field day. Um, and uh, so for one thing, the rules, uh, don't really allow for a uh, 500 watt battery entry. They all assume if you're going to be on battery, you're going to run five watts, um, which is sort of disappointing. I, I would I would promote something that I would call the car battery challenge. I would say that you begin field day with a fully charged car battery, and that's your only power source, and you make as many contacts as you can with that. I think that would be a fun field day challenge. But uh, uh, I was thinking about operating an Aurora, and instead of running it at 500 watts, I would run it at 100 watts, and it's still way more efficient than uh, any other 100 watt transceiver, even at that reduced power level. Um, and uh, so, uh, it could give you longer battery life or uh, reduced uh, fuel consumption on a generator. Um, I don't know, you know, if uh, the if it would really make a difference to your home energy consumption if you used it as a as a base station but again depends on how much time you spend on the radio and what kind of transmissions you make um you know it might be way more efficient to use single sideband or cw than it would be to use fd8 for example so fd8 is 50 percent duty cycle but single sideband is considerably less um so uh, it, it depends on the duty cycle as far as the total energy consumption. I think we kind of identified how, uh, what polar modulation is, it's just another way of describing the same thing as I and Q and, and how it plays into the uh, architecture. It provides the signals that we need to drive a switching amplifier. And therefore it's, it's kind of the obvious choice mathematically for how to process signals to control a high efficiency switching amplifier. Tony, thank you so much for coming on again and uh, giving us your, your extremely valuable time. I know you had a call before this as well, and you're much in demand because everybody wants to find out about this. So, uh, you know, on behalf of the Amateur Radio community, we wish you an amazing Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks again, David.